Well, you guys got quiet perfectly on time, so I really appreciate it. This introduction is going to be a little bit longer due to the reality of we don't have a sound system for tonight. So first, I want to thank Josh from Orca Media. Um, Orca Media is going to post the uh, or put online whatever the um, you know recording. So if you know people that didn't get to come, and I believe probably Tim's going to put that in the article that we be about yeah. this. Um, so thank you, Orca Media. Tim Calabro is really the person that's doing all the logistics with the candidates and um, the questions. So we thank the Herald. And then this event is being sponsored in part with the Herald with the Brookfield Community Partnership. And two things I want to say about the Herald and the Brookfield Community Partnership is basically they exist because they get community support. So in order to pay for the AA batteries that we don't have tonight, we need people to donate. <laughs> We also need you to buy a Herald on your way home or next week. Get one for your neighbor. Get one for your friend. That's what we literally need. Brookfield Community Partnerships donation box is in the back. Um, the other thing I will say, given there's no sound system, please be respectful. We've all forgotten how to be polite, it seems, during the last couple years. Let's try to remember tonight. No talking to your neighbor. Let's not cheer for a particular answer that we may or may not like, or this isn't a rally, so let's just hold everything till the end. And then um, they, I think what they've decided is they're gonna try to stand for each individual answer to try to project. Hopefully I'm projected. <coughs> Tim's gonna do the questions. Linda's our wonderful timekeeper. And I think Tim has the goal of, we'll be done with the formal questions by 8.15, and then we'll have time for cookies, which we didn't put out before you guys all got started. <laughs> Strategy. And then at some point, we'll kick you out because we have to clean up at seven. All right, well, thank you very much for coming, and I'll turn it over to Tim. Thank you. Welcome everyone. Um, Clotilde covered most of the basics. As she said, there's a lack of a sound system tonight, so if people cannot hear something, please let us know about that earlier so we can adjust our voices. Um, we're going to try to cover as many questions as we can, given the number of candidates we have here. So we're going to limit each response to about a minute, um, and then we'll have some time at the end of that um, for a, a longer closing remark so we can pick up on anything that uh, we couldn't get to later. And then there's going to be plenty of time afterwards for people to mingle and expound on whatever topics um, didn't come up in this. Um, so we're going to jump right into this then. Um, oh, yes, that's a good, good logistical 45 point. 45 seconds. Yep. 60 seconds. Well, your time. That makes sense to everyone. Okay. Linda's got the yeah. time. Thank you. I was I looking for the clock. Yeah. 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 So you'll have a, a you'll have a cue to figure out how to wrap things up. Yeah. Um, so the very first thing I'm going to have everyone do is just go down the line and introduce yourselves and uh, <laughs> say anything that's relevant to uh, you know why you want to run for office and why don't we start on the end with the Jay. Sure. Thank you, Brookfielders and neighbors near and far for showing out tonight. Um, I want to first thank the Herald of Randolph and uh, the Old Town Hall of Brookfield and its surrogates for again uh, facilitating a tradition of democratic expression. I do hope indeed tonight's conversation is robust and also uh, civil. I am Jay Hooper. I represent the five towns of Brookfield, Braintree, Randolph, Granville, and Roxbury. I'm currently seeking my fourth term, if you can believe that, and I still look 19. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's a French expression that goes, uh, petit à petit, les yeux fait son nid, which basically translate lo translates loosely to, uh, little by little, the bird makes its nest. And uh, I'm hoping you'll support me to continue building. <laughs> I'm Wayne Townsend. I was born right here in Randolph at Gifford and I want to thank all of you folks for coming. I'm running for a state representative to give all of you the voice um, that you have, some of you may not have had for a while 
and to bring some balance to Montpelier so we're not so uh, lopsided in our legislature up there. Um, so I'll be looking to gain your support tonight and be happy to answer all the questions and hope that I pick up your support by the end of that. Thank you. Can I have his extra time? <laughs> <laughs> I'm John Parr. Um, I'm in Brookfield. I'm running for Senate against Mark McDonald. I'm a little concerned about suggestions we wouldn't be civil. I've never had anything but civil relationships with these gentlemen, including Mark and I, and we disagree on some issues, but I think most of us agree on many of the problems we want to solve if we don't always agree on how to solve them. So as some of you have seen, my credentials are, I am, I am a former attorney. I have farmed for many years. Those, I think, are relevant skills. And I remarked to Jackie on the way down that you know, perhaps I should just run as a Democrat, which she actually wanted me to do. Because if you took the three issues that I'm most focused on, which is farming, pensions, and reducing regressive taxes, I could have done so equally as a Democrat, which I was for my entire life. And when I ran for governor, I was attacked because I admitted that I had voted for Obama twice. Now I'm being called MAGA, which I don't have the hat, I've never had the slogan, and I don't really fully know why people are trying to label me that way instead of just talking about the issues. So I'm really glad that we can talk about the issues tonight. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Clark. I want to thank you all for having us here and for having us, uh, giving us an opportunity to speak about why we're here and what we want to do. Um, I'm not a politician. I'm a mother, a farmer, a horse trainer, and a nurse. And I'm here basically to speak out for a lot of my patients who are elderly people and um, do not have, feel that they have a voice. And last winter they were coming to me and while I was working at Gifford and telling me that they didn't know how they were going to pay for their heating oil, their food, and their prescriptions. So I was running around trying to get coupons for them and trying to do whatever I could to make things affordable. Um, I don't know what I'm gonna do this year. So this time I'm not working as a nurse and I feel like I have this opportunity to speak up for them and other people that can't. And that's why I'm here. I'd also like to thank Don Clotilde and the Winfield Community Partnership and Tyler for doing this forum again. Um, it's a, oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh -oh. I will try to <clears throat> speak louder. Um, my name is Lara Sapkowitz, and um, I'm one of your representatives along with Jay. I'm running for my second term in the house. Um, my wife, Jenny, and I have been living in Randolph for 20 years. Um, in a few weeks, we'll celebrate 20 years in our house here in Randolph. And, um, the longer we're here, the more we appreciate being here, and the more we appreciate all the fine people that we get to be with in this wonderful community. Um, and um, I think that's all I have to say. Thanks. <laughs> my name is Mark McDonald. I live a couple miles up the road. Um, I first went to that house in 1947 as a youngster. Um, this has been my community for since then. I serve in the Senate, I've served quite a while. I've learned in the Senate that you get things done by working with other people, not by grandstanding or being a loud and vocal dissenter. So, um, sometimes loud and vocal dissenters help, uh, help the rest of us get to the middle. We um, go to Montpelier to solve problems and to work with others. Uh, don't go up there to pick fights. I was very pleased in the last few years that the state of Vermont and the Senate voted a budget out from the Vermont Senate, 30 to nothing. Also had a pension bill that resolves the pension issues, 30 to nothing. We, that's what we do here, not what they do down in Washington. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. And before we get going, I just want to say thank you all for running for office because that's really, you know, what makes democracy work in this country is to have people who are willing to sacrifice their time to come to these things and spread ideas. So um, let me uh, start off with the, the questions here. Um, and we'll, since Jay started this time, we'll just keep rotating down through. So Wayne will get the first shot at this one. Um, a lot of people have uh, decried lack of uh, affordable housing in the state. Uh, I'd like to know how would you propose the legislature help create more housing, um, particularly in rural areas like this district? Well, with relatively high housing costs comes with high taxes and over taxation that we've endured year after year. 
But on the matter of creating more housing, would probably be working with our landowners instead of tax them out of the state to, and loosen up some of the rules to make it more affordable for them to be able to build houses um, and to be able to run them at an affordable rate by not putting more burden on said developers and uh, landowners. And some people may have the option of putting a second apartment in their house or something for a rental unit, but they have to go through all these rules and regulations, hoops to be able to do it. So lightening up some of the rules um, would be a good step. What Wayne said. <laughs> <laughs> I probably can't get off that easily. Actually, he has said it. Um, our affordable housing programs are actually, as some of you know, very, very expensive. Uh, actually, constructing housing is something like $300 a square foot in many cases. And it is because of the intense regulation. And as much as we want to conserve uh, against unreasonable development, Act 250 has been a little out of control. I think Governor Scott and others have agreed with that. I don't want to get rid of it, but I suggest that we reform it. It also very much favors development in existing urban areas and really puts a, a hindrance on people who want to develop in more rural areas. And a lot of people want to live in more rural areas. But in truth, we have kind of a crisis with this booming real estate market that is pushing a lot of people, as far as home ownership, which is immediately related to the cost of rentals and other things. So with the rising interest rates, I think that will correct, but I'm not sure how much government could do for that. But we can make it more affordable in the form of reducing electric rates and taxes and fees that are burdening all people. And that would help landlords and tenants as well. Thank you. Yeah. Well, what they said. But <laughs> Basically, I think a lot of people that I've talked to about the difficulty with the rental situation in these areas have told me that um, they, it's not worth it for them to keep the houses to rent because the taxes are so high and the way that things are so pro-renter and not the owner of the house that the, a lot of these um, rules make it so that it's, it makes more sense for them to sell than to sometimes have the property destroyed and then have, they have no recourse and not be able to get the people out of there. Um, so that's one thing that's, um, you know, legislatively I think that we could help that a little bit. Also, uh, if Ta I already hit on taxes, but decreasing the electric rates as well, and and uh, Reform Act 250. Thank you. Sure. Um, for housing right now, um, the state has been putting many programs into place over the last several years, and has been um, spent already, or is going to spend on the order of hundreds of millions of dollars um, into housing. So we're really doing a lot. Um, if, to help the state do much more, um, we're gonna start to run into problems where who do we actually get to do the work? We're, we're kind of maxed out on our capacity. We're kind of moving, we're pretty much moving full steam ahead um, as we speak. Um, so, so those are the, in terms, in terms of bringing resources from the state to bear on the housing, crisis. Um, that is well underway, and really we're going to have to wait for a few more years to see how this all pans out. Um, in terms of the regulatory environment, we did recently pass <coughs> Act 250 legislation that will make it easier to develop in downtowns where people can live in walkable communities and, um, and, and live in, in places where we really want development and, and not out in, in the middle of our forests, which need to be protected. Uh, we spent $90 million this year for housing. We did it in three major areas. First, um, we changed Act 250 in downtowns. This is a town that has a zoning ordinance that encourages housing or housing development area. area. Act 250 does not apply. It, it's gone. We put money into taking second and third floors of villages like uh, towns like Randolph, which don't meet code and following the example set by Randolph with the uh, Red Lion and bringing them up to code so that people can live downtown and don't have to drive out five miles to put in a mobile home to, because that's the only place they can afford. We also have a program that we put in for granny apartments for houses, families that have grand, grandparent, uh, excuse me, mother-in-law apartments to bring them up to code and help them have a separate entrance 
so that they can rent them out to young people. We'll probably discuss later the, uh, the sale of houses being gobbled up by out-of-state folks with money. And Jay, what's running now? I'm ready. Vermont uh, has very old housing stock. There's quite a lot of houses in Vermont. And if your house has not been weatherized to date, it needs to be. I believe that we need to couple climate mitigation with uh, restoring those houses that, that, that local governments would, would condemn or, or consider derelict and invest aggressively in, in, in fixing that, solving that issue. If you drive through Randolph, Vermont, there are corridors along the downtown you look left and right, and you think, why are these houses in the same condition they were when I, 28-year-old Jay Hooper, was in kindergarten? Affordable housing is a fleeting concept, and I don't know that government itself will solve that problem. But we have to figure out ways to solve other problems at the same time if we're going to make enormous investments in fixing affordable housing in Vermont. Thank you. Thank you, All right, uh, next question, uh, John gets to start this one. Um, so Vermont has uh, goals of getting to using 90% uh, renewable energy by 2050, I believe it is. Um, what policies can state government put in place to reach that goal and, and should it? Well, I, I think we have to stay within what's feasible. And as a lot of my writing is about, I'm actually authoring a book that's coming out to address this issue. Uh, one of the best programs is weatherization. And it is based on income. So you get more weatherization benefits if you're low income. Uh, whatever we do to improve the environment, one of my big complaints is that the way we've been doing is extraordinarily regressive. We talk about helping people with housing, but Vermonters pay $37 million a plus a year, according to the DPUC, in extra electric rates to fund solar panels and EV cars for those who can afford them. If you get solar panels, then you don't have to pay those rates anymore. It's extraordinarily regressive. My background is in tax policy. This is without regard to the effectiveness of such things. Rooftops are raised are about twice as expensive as other um, methods. I ask people to look at my policies because we really need to, we need to be affordable. And uh, that's the first issue. And the second issue is, do they work? Is it feasible to go to all electric vehicles? It really is not, as more people are seeing. And manufacturing solar panels in China does not help the planet. It accelerates its deterioration. Jackie? I think when we're talking about renewable energy, we have to also have to consider um, the population here and what they can afford to do. And if we're talking about not allowing people to burn any oil anymore, putting any more um, oil furnaces in new homes, I think that's going to be kind of regressive with people who are older. I think we kind of have to phase in gradually, and I think that this is going to be difficult to do with the um, current goals that they have. Um, also, as far as um, the LCAR legislation, the administrative rules, only 15% of Vermonters support this. This is getting rid of all gas-powered vehicles by 2033, and this is going to be really difficult to implement Firstly, but if only 15% of Vermonters um, are for this, 65% are against, and 20% are undecided, why are we pushing forward? Why is our government pushing this forward at this time? You know, we all want, I think personal responsibility is the answer. Clear? Yeah. Um, 2050 is a quite a long way from now still. Um, it's 2022, so we have another. 28 years to get there. Um, that's as long as Jay's been alive. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we really do have time to make these goals in an incremental way. Um, but we do also need to start now and make it important now. Um, one of the things that we should be doing, which we um, didn't do this past legislative session, was to pass the Clean Heat Standard, which would have really helped us along towards those those goals. Um, instead, we're going to have to go back and do it again next year. So we've, we've lost time. Um, the Clean Heat Standard would, would allow us to slowly, incrementally, over the next several years, move towards helping our thermal um, sector go to alternative energy. Um, 
and at the same time it would benefit the lowest income Vermonters the most. But we could have a debate on this issue um, and a discussion for three hours on any night. Solar. <laughs> Solar has allowed us to not have to spend a lot of money on air conditioning in the afternoons. It's a money saver. Clean heat. Vermonters cannot afford to continue using fossil fuels. And we need to have a system that helps low-income Vermonters when every 20 or 25 years they've got to put in a new furnace or a new uh, propane furnace. That's the time to help them switch to renewable fuels because if they buy a new oil furnace, they are trapped for the next 20 or 25 years and at the mercy of oil prices. We've got to crack that nut and we've got to do it now because Vermonters use more oil than any other heating source and it's unaffordable. Okay, Jay, go for it. Mark is right. We have to crack that nut, um, whether we like it or not. Vermont, we're a small state, we're a small population. We don't have the economic clout that surrounding states have. And the farther you go, you know, the more you see that. This is one of those topics. Vermont, we, don't, we do not have a, a well that we get petroleum. We do not produce our own petroleum. We do not, we're, we are energy dependent on our neighbors. And what the clean heat standard does, this policy, the idea, is to position Vermont ahead of a transitioning marketplace so that we are not tied, our hands are not tied when the time comes to be able to, to, to figure out how to solve that, that, that transitional problem. I, it, it's, it, it's gonna be uncomfortable for, for Vermonters wallets, maybe, but here's the thing. The wholesaler is not actually losing capital, they're transitioning credits, and they're able to to use that in ways that, put, that give Vermonters a, a, the opportunity to invest in energy sort, in, in renewable energy. Hey, wrap it up, Jay. <laughs> 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 All right, Wayne. <laughs> I'm all for protecting our environment for ourselves and our future generations, but I'm not for pushing already struggling Vermonters into paying for something that they can't afford or taxing them to pay for somebody else's to protect our environment. It's steps that we need to take gradually when we can and what we can afford and there's lots that we can do as individuals to protect our environment as we can. But taxing people and pushing rules and regulations, forcing them to, we've got people that are making the decision, do I buy my food today, do I buy my heat today, or do I buy my medication? We got some people struggling so bad, I don't even think they could afford another blanket, for Christ's sakes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, um, next on the docket here, uh, Jackie gets this one first. Um, what, if anything, should the legislature do to support businesses and job creation in the state? There are a lot of jobs right now that are open and it seems like every store that I go by says Hope Wanted. So I think part of it might be that we get um, some of the people that um, are not working, working, and also in farming. This is a big issue in, that I've been a proponent of. Um, we need to bring small farms into Vermont. People who want to farm make it easier for them. John and I worked really hard to start a uh, farming business in the Northeast Kingdom. We have all kinds of hoops to jump through. We started a um, cheese processing facility. We built the milk, the bulk tank room, the milking parlor. We milked goats and, sh and cows in the same room, eight and four. And we had to jump through all kinds of hoops, and some of them were really not necessary. Also, it makes it very difficult for young farmers to start up a business, say, making butter or raw milk cheeses. You can jump over the river and you can sell your cheeses over there, but you can't sell them over here because of the way that our, our laws are in this state. So 
I just think nobody's dying over there, so maybe we should start thinking about that and making it easier for young farmers. Larry? Um, Vermont's unemployment rate is, is one of the lowest in, in the nation, has been for quite some time, and it really doesn't seem like um, job creation is, is really where we need to go. I mean, what we really need is to get people um, to fill the jobs that are, that are currently going unfilled. And, um, and the, the best way that we can do that is, is really just to continue to make Vermont you know, an even more wonderful place to live so that people who have the skills to fill these jobs um, want to be here, um, especially younger people, people with families who need childcare, um, who need you know, good health services, things that we are starting to invest more in and, and hopefully we'll continue to do so in the future. Um, so that folks want to be here to fill those jobs. Clean heat, weatherized, both are big job creators, put Vermonters to work. And when you get people off fossil fuels and oil, Vermonters spend $700 million a year out of state paying for oil. If you didn't have to, help, we didn't have to buy that much oil, that $700 million that gets spent in the state. You spend $700 million in the state, you're creating jobs. Weatherization is jobs. Installing heat pumps is jobs. And getting off fossil fuel is jobs. You're not going to find, you're not going to generate jobs doing the same thing that we've been doing right along. You can't ship $700 million out of the state every year just to heat people's homes. That doesn't even get into transportation, where a similar amount of money is being shipped out of state for automobiles <coughs> that use gasoline. Tim, would you repeat the question just so I know yeah. for sure I'm going to answer? Absolutely. What, if anything, should the legislature do to support businesses and job creation in the state? So I think as a member of the House Education Committee, um, it's been a privilege for me to go door to door and learn that one of the most common sentiments amongst our neighbors is that workforce development is the most important thing for, for our education, public education system to consider early on. There are nations like Germany, for instance, I've heard cited constantly for the programs about eighth graders, you know, getting familiarized with plumbing or you know, what it would be to pursue an education uh, to become an electrician. You know, it's the technical skills that we're going to need more students in Vermont to grow up understanding. And uh, I believe that if it's a question of uh, you know, how do we um, develop our workforce, it's going to be uh, earlier than later. And, uh, Education, the education community is where we'll do that. As a legislature, I think that lightening up some of the rules and regulations that keep businesses from coming here um, would be a good start. And some of the rules and regulations that come along with the younger generation being able to farm where we can grow the food from our land creates a lot of job opportunity. Right now, there seems to be plenty of jobs out there. I work at Harmon Hearth and Homes, which was the former Vermont Castings. I melt iron down there 12 hours a night. I actually got tonight off so I could do this debate. Um, I had to get two people to cover my shift, but I pulled it off. Um, so what we do is we make wood stoves that um, produce heat with renewable energy so that um, it creates more jobs in the workforce with loggers, woodcutters, along those lines, and it's a renewable energy source, so it's a pretty good thing in wood heat, good heat source. Thank you. Well, there's actually a, a lot we can do. The funda fundamental foundation of any economy is production. And uh, we need to grow an economy that's now become increasingly dependent on tourism. As the national economy declines, one of the first things that goes is tourism. Vermont once had a vibrant agricultural economy. We can again. The very things we see right now, inflation in oil and other things, fertilizers are tripled, or doubled, I, I, I beg your pardon. No, tripled in the last two years, all three basic fertilizers. They're going to stay high. 
Everything that destroyed family farms is going to bring them back to be more productive and more uh, cost competitive. We have out-of-state markets that we don't meet the demand of for Vermont-produced meats. And Mr. Sackwich mentions um, you know, more child care and health services. Well, one care of Vermont is costing us millions. It's not improving health care. These are bureaucratic policies, and if we're spending $700 million a year for oil, instead we're going to spend it for solar panels, instead of buying cars around the state, we're going to buy electric cars around the country out of state. We need to produce things here because that's the foundation, not services. And the people installing things don't bring long-term uh, work to us any more than the people that build JP. It's short-term for our people. Long-term, it's making profits for other states and other countries. We need to farm is what we need to do. It's a big business there. All right. Uh, Larry gets first crack at this one. Um, on the ballot this November, uh, Vermont voters are going to be seeing uh, Prop 5, constitutional amendment that guarantees abortion rights. How do you feel about that amendment? And if it uh, fails to pass, how should the legislature follow up in that eventuality? Um, I support, I strongly support the amendment. I think it's, it's a, important thing for Vermont to have, especially given the recent Supreme Court decision. Um, if, if it doesn't pass, um, you know, Vermont already has very strong laws that protect the rights of people to have abortion. Um, and so I, I don't think there really would be much for us to do. In fact, um, the governor signed a, a bill not too long ago um, that, that helped make that the case. So. You know, this this uh, this um this amendment is, is really about making sure that we have this in place for many years to come. Um, but in, in the short term, if, if it doesn't pass, um, we we won't you know we won't see any, any difference um, in the legislature. Okay. Our government shouldn't be telling women what to do on health care issues. That's not our job. I hope the amendment passes. If it doesn't, um, we will be subject, possibly subject to national uh, national laws. We've seen Lindsey Gray in the last couple of weeks. Um, women should be in charge of health care decisions. They want to speak to their, their religious counselors. So they want to speak to their family. Uh, they want to speak, most of all, to their doctors. They should be free to do that, to make decisions for themselves, and the government shouldn't be telling them what to do. I fully support um, a woman's right to consult with her practitioner uh, as to the health of her and her child um, based on the circumstances of that prospective birth. No doctor, excuse me, most doctors have a moral compass. No hospital does not have an ethics committee. No mother does not have, uh, possess a, a maternal intuition as to their offspring. If it comes to a certain threshold that we're going to debate in government as to when said abortion could take place, uh, those institutions would uh, consider that reality accordingly, and as I said, full unrestricted access to reproductive rights is something that I supported and would continue to support. Before, before you go in, I think you missed the, one, the very last section. Um, if, it, if, the, uh, if Prop 5 does not pass, should the legislature take it up again? If Prop 5 doesn't pass, that would be the will of the voters. And I think that that would be a message that the legislature ought to receive loud and clear. Do I think that that's possible? No. Thanks, Wayne. I think with this piece of legislation going through the proper channels, it's going to leave it up to all of you to make that conscious decision on how you want to vote, whether you are for it or whether you are against it. I personally think that this piece of legislation was poorly written and wasn't wrote with much consideration due to some of the unclarities of what can happen in the terms of how long an abortion can be performed up until birth, which I personally do not agree with. But I personally think that women should have 
that say between her and her doctor not to be regulated or controlled by her government. Uh, Wayne, same question. Just can you, if it does, if, uh, if it doesn't pass, pass this time, I don't know that. I think we have more concerning things to do um, in the state to bring affordability and stuff than to try to kick another can down the road. Okay, thanks, John. I'll answer the last first. It's a <laughs> non-issue. Vermont already has the strongest support laws in the country for abortion. After the big battle we had some years ago, Proposal Five is an abomination. It, there are only two countries in the world that have more lax laws than ours, and that's North Korea and China. The repeal of Roe versus Wade does not impact Vermont's ability to provide women with abortions. The late-term abortions that we're talking about, abortions that are uh, performed at anybody's choice, Roe versus Wade did not approve of those. Roe versus Wade specifically recognized fetal viability at a certain point. And we don't recognize fetal personhood in this state if a pregnant woman is assaulted by a man, a domestic partner, or a drunk person and loses their child. That, to me, would be putting women's rights first. But Mr. McDonald says the government has no business telling people what to do. 90% of Americans oppose late trimester abortions. And here in Vermont, I think it's about 80%. So I really don't know why this is even necessary. When we, there's no question, there's no legislature, with, hey, 30 to 0 on the budget that puts on more taxes on us. There's nobody that's going to take away the abortion rights of women. Late-term abortions, there's no reason to defend them. Either they're not performed or they shouldn't be. The studies show that, uh, well, I, I do that. Thanks. Hi. I'm an ex-OBGYN nurse, and I have special certification in neonatal resuscitation. And maybe I have a little different perspective. Um, but I think first, we need, I'll answer the second part first. No one in Vermont is going to lose their rights to have an abortion. Um, <laughs> Article 22 is very misleading because it's much more radical than Roe versus Wade, um, which was trying to strike a balance between the rights of the mother and the rights of the developing life. And I believe that if we're going to um, if we're going to push late-term abortions, we have to think about what we're doing firstly, but secondly, we have to think about why we're pushing it when. Oh, 89 to 90% of Vermonters, from a, I wrote um, a Harris Harvard poll in June of 22, which was published in Vermont Digger, um, showed that 89 to 90% oppose abortion after six months. Only 10% of the um, population think abortion should be legal after six months. So why are we pushing a legislation that people already don't agree with? But we have to think about those babies, because we have three choices. This is a fully viable baby. My children are born at seven and a half and eight months. I'm sorry, is that the first? Yes, okay, yes. sorry. Yes. sorry. Yes. sorry. Yes. I can talk to you more. Okay. And I, I think as Mark pointed out earlier, all of these questions could be their own debate if we had if we had that. Let's time. do it again. Yeah, right? <laughs> Let's start earlier. And cookies first. Perfect. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, Larry started that one. Mark gets the first crack at this one. Um, Vermont uh, has uh, taken steps to address the uh, opioid drug problem, including uh, expanded access to treatment services and expanded enforcement. Uh, what do you think the state should focus on going forward in the coming session? This is one I wish Ben Jiggling were here. Yeah, me too. Ben spent more time on this issue than uh, any one of us. We have an opiate crisis that came about when the pharmaceutical companies convinced uh, our doctors to prescribe medication for pain. And it addicted a lot of folks. Uh, one of the things that was shocking about the beginning of our opioid crisis was that it wasn't kids or 20-year-olds, it was 50-year-olds, 40-year-olds, 30-year-olds. I don't have the answer to it. Treatment gets people back into mainstream, if you can get them into a program and get them treated before they get fentanyl or before something catches up with them and kills them. Um, chasing down the street level, the street level folks can fill our prisons and they'll be replaced with more street level sellers. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Sure. I too do not know the answer to that question. Governor Shumlin dedicated, I think, almost the entirety, Patsy French could probably, Mark was there, uh, 
about solving this issue. And people have complained to me and my colleagues since that the issue has not been solved. And we lawmakers are complacent, complicit, I guess, in that, in that failure. For that, I suppose I can say collectively we should apologize. Uh, what I would hope to see is um, uh, an exploration as to the data about the folks who are dealing with addiction that every day you wouldn't think are dealing with addiction. It's more common than you would know. But the way I think that we need to solve addiction is to change the conversation and go in the directly, not walk, but run in the direction of harm reduction. And basically destigmatize the conversation so that ordinary people can have a, a, a comfort zone that is expansive enough to, com to discuss this thing. I'm over. I think we could handle this two different ways. We could keep handling it the way our current legislatures have been doing, by coddling a deadly epidemic, by enabling them through these different programs we have, giving them drugs to try to get them off of drugs. Or we can take a new approach by electing new representatives that will send a message and make a stand and stand up for our law enforcement and stop with these catch and release policies and let them know that Vermont is not going to tolerate it and to hopefully distract some of these people from coming to Vermont with these narcotics. I was a special public defender for a number of years in Connecticut during the crack cocaine epidemic there and this Fed mill is tens of thousands of times worse. And yes, the first wave started with the pharmaceutical industry. Now we're on the fourth wave, or third wave, which is the pharmaceutical industry. We're putting more and more people into dependency on Suboxone and Methadone at taxpayer expense without sufficient counseling. So I've actually addressed the Governor's Opioid Coordination Council. I'm a, a certified recovery coach, and I became one when I learned it was $6 a dose for heroin, cheaper than a good six-pack of beer, all right? Probably cheaper than perhaps Blue Ribbon. We have to increase police enforcement, not, yes, we destigmatize, but does anybody see what's happening to young children, these people who are addicted, and how, and how much this is a crisis, grandparents raising their children? We need to bring back enforcement. We're inviting south of the border people to come here and deal drugs, and that's why it's so cheap. And I've talked to police, and I've talked to many others. If we start to incarcerate people who are bringing the drugs here, then it will drive up the price, and then we can also um, stop giving people in prison Suboxone when they are only whenever they want to, because it's a prison currency. If you're in prison, you would take it. You trade it for drugs or money. What, what did you say south of the border? South of Vermont's border. Thank you to clarify, yes. I mean the cities of New York City and Boston and Springfield, Mass. And you can see in the news where the drugs come from. Sorry, good, thank you for being clarified. But they do ultimately come from Mexico, by the way. That's where you can follow the fentanyl analogs. <laughs> Sorry, Jack. Hey, okay. I worked with a doctor recently who is a part of the medically assisted treatment program, and what both of us found was most of these people are are they're getting the medically assisted treatment to get them off of the opioids, but they're not getting the support and the counseling that they need. If you do one without the other, I, and I'm talking about doing the medically assisted treatment without the support and the counseling, they have a very high rate of recidivism. So uh, maybe um, starting up, uh, we also talked about maybe doing a place where people could get out of their communities so they could be away from the drugs. But if they, if they keep the drugs out of Vermont, that would be the biggest help for them because they said it's way too easy. They said it's easier for them to get heroin than it is for them to get marijuana. So, you know, A, keep the drugs out of Vermont, B, support services and more counseling and more help from families, friends, and community members. Amen. Yeah. Larry? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, drug use and abuse has, I think uh, in some cases, for, for since time immemorial, a part of uh, human condition. Um, education goes a long way towards helping that. Um, providing healthy environments for people to live in goes a long way towards that. Why do people, you know, turn to these substances to, to begin with. Um, I, I think it is a really complicated problem. And, and I again don't, like some of my other folks up here, don't pretend to have um, an answer which I think is gonna make huge inroads into this. So we've been fighting these sorts of battles
for, for many, many decades. Um, we, we know that prohibition doesn't work. We know that stigmatizing it doesn't work. Um, we just have to keep looking for those solutions that work. We need to do the science, do the experiments, and follow the data. Okay, thank you guys. Um, just to do a quick time check, does it, you know what the time 7.45. 7.45, okay, so we've got a little bit more time to go. Okay, so um, next question, it looks like we're back around to Jay to start this one off. Um, so, uh, this lightning is, round, right? <laughs> we don't have a lightning round. This they already are. Yeah, no. they're already <laughs> 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 they are kind of fast. That bird's yeah. nest is Please. getting big. <laughs> so, um, uh, Act 250 okay. um, requires that plans for land development are first reviewed by the uh, by the board for a number of uh, different uh, items. Um, what are your thoughts on Act 250? Um, if you uh, if you don't feel that it's perfect the way it is, how would you propose adjustments to it? Sure, good question. I think Act 250. Uh, for anybody who's not aware, Act 250 is the landmark land use policy that Vermont, one of the policies Vermont is known for. It's, I think, the 53rd or 54th anniversary of that policy uh, being enacted. And at the 50-year mark, there was a general consensus in the General Assembly that we ought to review what ways uh, the, what tweaks we should change to that policy to, to make it more efficient so that it's not so arduous. I'm sure you all have heard uh, one of the most common complaints about the Act 250 process is that it is expensive for the little guy and it takes too long uh, to, to realize the reality of a project, particularly ones that are large and uh, would be economically beneficial to the state of Vermont. So yes, indeed, we should change the policy, but so far, and I've only got 15 seconds here, we've made, sure, be latest. Uh, that we've made two attempts, two major heavy lift attempts to fix this thing. And it failed both times because the complexities of the changes that we're making are so climate oriented that we can't agree on. There's more work to be done, and I support making it easier to right. develop. Yeah. All right, anyway, go for it. <laughs> I think Act 250 was another poorly written piece of legislation. I think it could be revamped. It does have a few good things in it with, as far as protecting our environment. But I think that if we had some common sense that we could sit down and do some round tables and come up with a plan that's not going to cost the uh, Anybody that's looking to build here in Vermont, so many hoops to go through and costs associated with it. Um, so it would be more encouraging that way and also having some of the same safeguards to be able to protect their environment because we all want to have clean air and we all want clean water and we know the needs for those. So I think that overall it could be revamped or redone with some consideration. Okay, John? Well, I think we all are agreeing that there could always be room for reform. One thing I know in tax law, we have tax codes that it's big because as soon as you create a law, others squirt out the, uh, in, in the edges. Act 250 is squirted out to just become so big, along with our bureaucracy in general, that it's imposing a huge tax burden on Vermonters in its implementation, but also it really stifles new investment. A lot of businesses don't even want to go through the process, and when they do, it costs them millions. It's also expanded to apply to farms and small farms, and as we've heard here, it's designed to, to inhibit any kind of rural development and force people into urban developments. Um, it's also, um, I, and I do want to mention that it is part of the problem of affordability. It's part of the problem of having jobs, and the, and the suboxone and the drug prices are all connected, and it is not since time immemorial that we've had drugs like carfentanil, uh, drugs that are so much po more potent even than heroin. There are whole new forms of drugs out there. So it's about economics. And the number one cause of addiction is adverse childhood experiences, which these children are now is, uh, having occur. So Act 250 relates to building the economy and all the questions we've been talking about. It needs to be paired back to be more balanced and more sensitive to the real economic costs that it imposes on businesses. Jackie? I'll speak a little bit from our own experiences as Act 250. Um, I've heard loggers also talk about how it, 
if, if you're not a humongous logging operation, sorry, uh, um, that you're not always doing exactly what's best for the reforestation by adhering to their laws strictly. It's um, cost prohibitive. And the way that they had had it before, where you could only take off the 10 acre pieces, made it so that you had a mega farm and you had all these small places. But if you just wanted to have a, a, a homestead farm, let's say 30 or 50 acres, it, you didn't fall in there. Act 250 wasn't helping you or um, making it feasible. So I think that um, in front of, it needs to be revamped. So it's more realistic for people who want to farm and at the same time hoping to preserve our rural communities. Larry, all yours. Um, like any piece of really complex legislation, um, Act 250 does you know, some things really well and some things not as well. Um, but on the whole, you know, when you look around at our landscape and you see how it's different from other places, you can thank Act 250. Um, Vermont looks the way it does largely because of Act 250. Our landscape would be very different today, and I think most of us would agree, not in good ways, if it wasn't for Act 250. Um, I have a feeling I'm going to run out of time well before I get into any more details. I spent a lot of time working on Act 250 in my role on the Natural Resources Fish and Wildlife Committee. Um, there are things that we can absolutely do to make it better, um, but our governor is getting in the way. He vetoed one of the big bills that we would have loved to have gotten through um, this past spring that would have made Act 250 a much better, much more effective tool um, to continue to make our landscape a better place. Uh, someone mentioned that Act 250 was poorly written. Actually, it was, it was written pretty well. It had the review process based on statewide zoning. And the legislature voted for the review process, but they voted against the statewide zoning, which put the whole thing into pretty much of a pickle. Um, the bill that passed last year for housing recognized that any town that had zoning doesn't have to go through Act 250. Zoning, if you complete your zoning in any town by town by town, you're out of Act 250. Agriculture is exempt from Act 250. Forestry is exempt from Act 250. Agriculture has to follow standard agricultural um, rules, um, and so does forestry. RAPs. RAPs. Thank you. Recommended agricultural practices. Need my seven seconds break. <laughs> and the governor has has vetoed several Act 250 reforms, and I think we'll continue to work with him until we get it worked out. All right. And uh, Wayne gets to start this one. All right. Uh, so in July, uh, UVM Medical Center Network requested a nearly 20% increase in um, the rates for commercial insurance charges. And that's just kind of uh, the most recent example of very quickly increasing health care costs. Uh, what should the uh, uh, state do to address uh, increasing costs in health care? What can the state do to stop the increase of health care? Stop interfering with our health care system? <laughs> I don't um, I really don't have an answer for that, for the 20% increase in UVM, you said? No, it's just an example. Yeah, an example. Yeah. yeah, I would probably look to the professionals that would be more qualified to answer that question. Somebody that's worked in healthcare with my running mate, Kathy. Um, so I don't have a good answer for that, so I'm not going to claim to. Thank you. Fair enough. John? Good answer. Um, I have a lot to say about it in 30 seconds. or uh, What Care Vermont is the big problem that's increased many of our costs. It is a bureaucratic entity that has cost millions of dollars. Doug Hoffer did an audit of it two years ago and showed that the salaries of those people were double what they received nationally. Many of the members also received high salaries to be on, um, in hospitals. They are deteriorating patient care by requiring more hoops to jump through with no demonstrable improvement in health care for anybody. They're pushing nurses and doctors out. Then we have to hire more 
out-of-state nurses at much higher rates. We hear about buying out-of-state oil and doctors, and they don't want to stay here. It is making it, it is choking us more bureaucracy. Vermont has nearly twice as many state and municipal employees as New Hampshire. We don't have their income. The number one thing we could do, rates for Blue Cross and Blue Shield and MVP Health are going to go up 15 to 20 percent in January for everybody. So not just UVM. And I've written articles about it. I'm told that my articles are so horrible. Read my articles on True North Reports, which also prints left-wing articles. And read my articles that go back about four years, three years, about why One Care Vermont is making patient care worse, and it's extraordinarily expensive, and it's enriching bureaucrats, and it's not doing anything to improve health care. That's the number one thing we do. And hire more nurses at BTC. In fact, expand <laughs> BTC. Have a great nursing program. I hear where that's coming from. Hey, Jack, you all yours. No, it's true. Right. We need more nurses. I'm going to quote some figures from uh, Doug Coffers, um, who's our state auditor. He said that it cost us $25.6 million more than it would have paid under the fee for service from Medicaid model. And 12 point, since its inception in 2017, and $12.7 million by the state in unaccountable expenditures uh, found that One Care Vermont lacked the proper financial oversight to ensure that it spent the money appropriately. It caught, and I have had to jump through their hoops and filled out hours of paperwork. So instead of spending my time talking to my patients or doing regular nursing jobs and the doctor that I worked with, we've had to fill out paperwork and go through charts because they don't just want, they want, um, say they, they're going to prescribe a certain drug and then one of your Vermont says that they need to, um, a patient has to be on these other drugs first. So then I have to go through the chart and find out when they were on the drugs, how long they were on for, and if they weren't, then they have to put on, put them on those drugs, even though that may not be in the patient's best interest. And I can talk to you later about some examples of where that's happened. Thank you. Larry Oyers. You know, One, one Care Vermont was an experiment. I mean, it's a continuing experiment. Uh, I don't think any other state in the, in the country has a program um, quite like it. <clears throat> and uh, it, it, sh it does not seem to be um, living up to its promise. Um, we have to think, though, about why we have One Care Vermont. And it really comes out of the fact that you know, we can toy out at the edges of these problems here at the statewide level. But this is, this is really a nationwide problem. We're not really going to solve this at the federal level. Um, we need some sort of version of Medicare for All that will take on this across state borders because we're, we're really not going to solve this um, as our own little state. Uh, the way to solve the cost of health care is to kick people off health care systems. If you take a look at the states that haven't done Medicaid, they simply drop people off and don't cover them. In Vermont, we are fortunate that we have many, many local hospitals. You don't have to drive far in Vermont to be served. In other states, North Carolina, for example, they did extraordinary consolidation. So people that have their own vehicles can get to hospitals that are 50 miles away, 40, 50 miles away. And folks that don't are stuck. Um, it's not an easy solution. The Europeans have figured out how to do it. Um, they're not perfect. Canada's not perfect, but we're still wrestling with this, and we live in a rural state, and we have pretty darn good health care. Is that the last one? Yeah, 10%. Well, I'll give the next person my 10 seconds. I need those. Well, this is yet another question that we really just wish Ben Jickling were here to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> And Wayne, I too could not shake a stick at the answer. I don't know. Uh, but I will say that I fundamentally believe that it is wrong for corporations, corporate interests, to benefit, to profit off of ordinary people and their illnesses. My understanding is we, we uh, a certain political regime has pursued single payer, help, uh, a single payer model. And uh, it became evident that that wasn't going to work. And it, uh, my understanding is that was sort of a costly experiment. Turns out maybe all payer is the, the prudent alternative. I think um, wiser heads would, would offer an answer to this question. And like I said, I don't have one. OK. All right, this one's. Um John gets the first crack at this one. This one's sort of a, um, 
philosophy of governance question. Um, so whoever is elected to either of these uh, seats will, um, will have to represent people and work with people who vehemently disagree with them. So as the elected official, what duty do you have to constituents who disagree with you? And how would you work with other legislators that disagree with you? Go for it. Well, as Mark said, sometimes it's good to have a critical voice in the room, and I think there could have been more critical voices in the rooms over the last couple of years. I've heard several people suggest uh, that the clean heat standard needs to be pushed because it's going to help low-income Vermonters. The clean heat standard will put a tax on oil. I don't see that how that helps low-income Vermonters. I'll be that voice because I'm a conservative, so-called. Actually, I just think I do math. And I welcome uh, fiscal Democrats to join me because everything I, if you look at my policies, I'm trying to force uh, everybody to come to the middle. We have extremes on both sides. Frankly, in Vermont, we have an extreme progressivism that has increased these costs. And everything I'm designing is to find consensus. What can we all agree on? We can come together on the pensions, which I've been writing about for years, are underfunded. Now the true number is about $10 billion in the red. That's going to require both sides. Either you're getting a state pension or you're going to pay the state pension. And now we've got pensioners pitted against taxpayers. Both sides are going to have to come together. Our whole nation needs to come together. And this is a state where we have civility and we can do that. And we can do it on all the issues that I've, I've highlighted. Thank you. Okay, Jackie. Um, I would say that as a nurse, I was a patient advocate. And as a legislator, I would be your advocates because I work for you. I don't feel like I'm supposed to go up there and just put my agenda forward. Uh, I, I want to know what my um, constituents think, what their feelings are on issues, and it's my responsibility to go into that legislature and represent them. Also, I think that this country has gotten so divided and so nasty, I'm more of a centrist. I think the Democrats and Republicans need to work together to solve our problems, stop calling names and being nasty and uncivil to each other, and work together in the legislature to solve the problems in Vermont. Because we're spending so much time looking, trying to call people names that we're not addressing the issues. Thank you. Eric? Yeah, the diversity of voices is critical. Um, one of the amazing things about being in, in the legislature, and this, this just, it was so impressed me every, every day that I was there, was that if you're, if you're in a committee room, the vast majority of the time, 95 plus percent of the time, you can't tell by the conversation who's a Republican, who's a Democrat in that room. People are there because they want to solve problems. The conversations are almost always respectful. People's voices are heard and respected. Um, and I was super proud to be a part of that process. In my committee, the Republicans were in the minority, um, but consistently contributed to legislation and made it better. Their voices were always heard and taken seriously. And I really valued having them being part of the process. We, we need a diversity of voices to make good laws. Right, Mark? I spend my time going door to door <coughs> during election time. And I, I'm over. 2,500 doors now, um, and most of it involves listening. And if you listen to people and um, get to the second layer of conversations, you know what they're worried about. Same thing in the legislature. Um, Larry's right. Committee moves, we take witnesses, we listen to people. They're, in Washington, D.C., they don't do that. They just line up on both sides pound away. Um, we lost two young Republicans this year um, with families that can't come back to the legislature, came back to the Senate, they've got to support their families. Um, they listened and they're gone. We lost a progressive. We had several um, up older folks retired. We're going to have 10 new people in the Senate and helping them learn how to listen and get along and work together is one of our top I think if you went to the state capitol in the session and asked anybody who's been around for a while, they would confirm that I am probably easily described as a recalcitrant Democrat. I go against the grain at times when I think it's very much uh, a priority for my constituents. 
there are certain constituencies, voting blocks, that really um, prefer a different preference to the, to the one of my party, which is the majority. Um, my two best friends in Montpelier are Casey Tooth, a Republican from St. Albans, and Chris Matos, a Republican from Milton. We're similar in age. These two gents are in their early 30s. Uh, one has kids and the other not. Um, we go out to lunch regularly. When I first showed up, <coughs> Democrats thought that was weird. Now, it's normal. I'm trying to prove that. <laughs> okay, well, you get the final word on this one. Well, it's going to be up to all of you folks on which combination that you send to Montpelier to represent you. If you send me to represent you, I'll be working with cross-party lines and try to bring reason to bring your voice to them. And at these campaigns, sometimes they get a little bit heated and sometimes there might be a hostility towards the other one. But at the end of the day, we all live here together. We need to work together. And I think we need to sit down, do some round table talks and bring more to the table than a bickering or <laughs> battle of the sides of Democrat, Republican, so, like my friend Jay, sometimes we disagree on an issue. At the end of the day, we're friends, whether we disagreed on it or not. And like with Jackie, she's just a real likable person, so I would work well with her. Larry, I don't know him long enough to know much about him, but at the end of the day, I would work with anybody that I'm there to work with. Thank you. All right. Uh, when, how are we doing on time? 807. 807, okay. Only an hour left. Yeah, I know. Right? Um, the, instead of instead of jumping through another question, let's um, let's take some time and do some closing remarks, and that way you all can bring up anything that we um, that we glossed over or that we missed entirely. Although there's obviously going to be a ton of that. Um, but one thing I would ask before you uh, wrap up is make sure to tell people how they can get in touch with you and find out more about your about your campaigns. So I think I think Jackie gets to gets to start this one off. And Jim, why don't you just 90 seconds Yeah, I was that's a great idea. Um, Jackie Clark for Vermont is my Facebook page. I've never been on Facebook before but felt I have to be most incognito now and be more accessible. So if you'd like to contact me there. Um, uh, I just hope that if you have concerns you, or things that are important to you that you'd like me to bring forward to the legislature, if I do get effect, uh, elected, that you would please contact me. Um, like I say, we're all neighbors. We need to work together. We need to work for the best of our state. And I just wanted to clarify a little something about when we were talking about health care and um, funding. Um, how does how does One Care Vermont translate to higher rates with with Medicaid and a Blue Cross and Blue Shield? And that's because you're taking a lot of the time away from the nurses and doctors doing paperwork, and they're becoming paper pushers. And so that you're ha you're having to pay more to do. They're spending more time to do their job plus this. So it, it all trickles down, and people end up paying more for their health care, and it may not be as good as it was. Also, um, I like to, I'm an advocate for, like I said, for people who are elderly and can't speak for themselves. And I started out talking about how people weren't able to pay for their bills. And I think that goes into the, uh, our, that clean heat standard, but it's going uh, it to cost more people, more people money in fuel bills. Thank you. Larry, go for it. Um, I also have a Facebook page. It's pretty easy to find. I also have a website, Larry. Um, mostly, though, I like to talk to people, so if you would like to know more about how I feel about any of these topics or anything else, um, please give me a call at 802-249-2280, and I'll be really happy to talk. Um, I'd like to respond, um, since it's a, you know, we don't like to change the Constitution very often, so I'd like to come back to our constitutional amendment question that we had, and just really emphasize that the language in the amendment is very clear. It's really very clear. What it says is that nothing will change. We will keep the practice around abortion and reproductive rights in Vermont exactly as it is right now. Late-term abortion 
is rare in Vermont, it is highly regulated in Vermont, and it will continue to be so. It will not change at all when this new amendment, I hope, expect, passes this November. All right, thank you. Mark? Yeah. Uh, my opponent has mentioned several times about progressive regressivity in heating, we have regressivity in transportation, and we have regressivity in electricity. We try to overcome that. The tax on heating oil today is a penny. It hasn't changed. Excuse me, 1%. It hasn't changed. The tax on propane is 1%. It hasn't changed. The tax on natural gas is 3 cents. But natural gas is regulated, and there are programs to help people use less natural gas through insulation, etc. And finally, electricity. We've done best in electricity, let me, and the tax is 8% on your electric bill. 20 years ago, there was no tax on your electric bill. 20 years ago, Vermont had the highest electric rates in New England, and they'd been the highest for 20 years. The 8% today, we start out with a small tax, each year it's gone up a little bit. That money has been spent to put in better refrigerators, better ceiling fans, better air conditioners, etc., etc. We use 15% less electricity today than we did 20 years ago, and we have the next to the lowest electric rates in New England. Thank you. Right. Okay. <laughs> Jay Hooper. 299-6371, that's my cell phone number, 728-6659, right down far. <laughs> I have it anyway. Those are the best, it's a, it's, it's a telephone call that will best get you in touch with me. My house is in Randolph Center, if I were to not pick up, you come slam on my door like everybody else. <laughs> I'm seeking my fourth term, again, I will ask you for your support tonight. The reason is because I enjoy this job so thoroughly. I think the reason I enjoy it so thoroughly is because I really care to learn about what it is that makes people different from each other. What makes you distinctly yourself as to your neighbor. What variables really define your perspective on the issues relative to the people around you. I'll leave you with this. My job, understand, is not to change your opinions, your minds. It's to understand them. I listen to that, and that I hope you will respect. And support me. Uh, Wayne, before you go, I forgot to have Mark say we're to track him down. <coughs> Senator Mark at AOL.com. Awesome. Go for it. <laughs> Wayne Townsend, 53 at Yahoo.com, or 802 855 1617. If you send me to Montpelier, we got some key issues that we need to focus on. It's going to be affordability, safety in our communities, and what's being taught to our children in our schools. Those are some key issues with the struggling of my elders right now with uh, the cost of everything from overtaxation and our 401ks and our stock portfolios <coughs> have been dwindling. I looked at my stock portfolio last night and it was down. 20 and a half percent and we steadily dropped today as well. So I am worried about our people at retirement age that had planned and saved and are counting on this and they're not having that money now and taxing on our social security when our seniors have already paid on that money through taxation all the way to that point and now they're on a fixed income and by taxing them on it, it's kind of absurd. And there's a lot of states that don't tax Social Security, so I think that might be a good start if we could do away with the tax on Social Security to help our seniors out that are struggling to pay their heat, their groceries, or their medications. Um, you send me there, I'll work with whoever you send me with, and I wanna hear from you on the issues that you care about, because it's you that I'm working for. I'm not going up there to work for the government. I'm going there to work for the representative, the community and my constituents that send me there. Thanks, John. Thank you. 
I think uh, what Vermonters want and why so many people are here is not so much controversy, but our country and our economy are declining. And they want to know that people are authentic and that they can trust us and that we can actually give them hope and do something. Uh, I have spent almost my entire life working for other people. I have 30 years uh, on the bar in Connecticut without any ethical blemishes. I not only worked as a special public defender, which is a volunteer position, I actually lose money to do that, but in juvenile court, in probate court, where I dealt with people with Alzheimer's, where I dealt with people in juvie courts. So there's so much there that it overflows into our practices because I always felt it was my job to be pro bono, to give back. And uh, some have criticized me for leaving my law practice early. I should clarify, I was destroyed with Lyme disease. And it manifested as fibromyalgia syndrome, and I have struggled with it for years. That's why I don't have a 401k. I don't have a savings account. I live paycheck to paycheck or whatever money we can scrape by. And that's why I relate to people on low income. And when Mark McDonald says we've only got a 1% tax here, he wants to raise it. He wants to, they want to raise the heat standard and put a tax on oil. We can't afford it. And it's hurting those. This is regressive taxation. Not progressive, the name of the party, but regressive. My top three issues are farming, uh, but also the pensions. I've been writing about it for years. It's much worse than they're saying because they've been mismanaged. Now we're in a crisis. And the regressive tax structures. Those are things I have the qualifications to do, and I can give you hope. But I'm actually going to repeal that net metering part that hurts low income. That's immediate money in people's pockets. And that's what will build the, 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 the true economy. Now's my chance to go Because then people have more money to spend in our businesses and spend in our Vermont businesses. Thank you. All right, last thing, John. Where, uh, where are you find Clark, Clark2022.com or ClarkForSenate.com. And my email's real easy. It's FarmerJohnClark at gmail.com. Happy to hear from people. I'm really grateful. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. That was incredibly productive, I think. Obviously, like we said earlier, this is just a very small sampling of the issues that the, our representatives are gonna face uh, in Montpelier. So people who have, in the audience who have questions, please track them down and everyone, let's go enjoy some cookies.